Uh, good evening. Uh, today is the 28th of uh, January. For those watching on videotape on a date other than a Thursday, uh, this is the Arlington School Committee. Uh, and uh, we have uh, to start with some sad news. Unfortunately, Roland Chappett, uh, who we all know as Raleigh, uh, probably one of the most dedicated uh, volunteers of this town uh, passed away over the weekend. Uh, he was the husband of Janet Sullivan, uh, loving father of Philip Chaffet and wife Lucille Wuburn, Susan Robinson and husband Spencer of Arlington, Thomas Chaffet and wife Christina of Lexington, Ann Riley, the husband of John of Brockton, and John Chaffet and wife Melissa Smithfield, Rhode Island, survived by 10 grandchildren and many nieces and nephews. Uh, Roland was a Korean War Army veteran. He served on Arlington Town Meeting for over 44 years. A member of the Redevelopment Board, Conservation Commission, Friends of Robbins Farm, the Dallin Museum, Tourist Council. He worked on the Brackett School Council. He was on our redistricting <coughs> team. Uh, and that's just a partial list. He was, he was on committees we haven't even invented yet. Um, he, he, he was just an amazing force for this town. Uh, funeral tomorrow, 10 a.m. at St. Eulalia's in Winchester. Um, relatives and friends invited. Uh, so a moment of silence for Raleigh. Okay, and we have, next is public participation. Uh, public participation is limited to three minutes. Uh, we listen while you talk. We do not respond in public participation. Uh, we may elect to go and uh, bring your item up uh, by a referral to a subcommittee later, um, uh, but we won't discuss anything or act upon it tonight unless it's on our agenda. Uh, the first one is uh, Juliette Moore. Good evening. My name is Juliet Moyer. I have three children at Thompson. I wanted to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for your recommendation to place modulars at Thompson and for your recommendation to support permanent construction. Um, I'm here tonight to ask that you continue to aggressively push forward to seek funding for permanent construction at Thompson Elementary. I know that you all know that the modulars placed at Thompson are just a band-aid giving the students a one-year reprieve um, from the loss of our art room and large class sizes. I've sat in on uh, various task force meetings and subcommittee meetings, and I know that you all have the very same concerns that the parents of Thompson have about the short-term nature of the solution. Having been at the, to the enrollment task force meetings, it's clear that many on the task force want to wait to see how Arlington's actual numbers compared with, compare with the McKibben projections. And um, given that Thompson is already over McKibben's projections at 435, I urge you to please continue to advocate for the students of Thompson um, and the students across town to recommend funding of a design phase for Thompson's permanent addition to avoid additional costs spent on temporary fixes. We know it's critical for funding approval to occur in April to avoid large class sizes in 2017 and 2018 and to alleviate the ongoing core space shortage that we have. Thanks very much. Thank you. Timur Yantar. Hi, I'm uh, Timor Yantar, Thompson parent, precinct seven, 15 year resident. I'd like to comment on middle school overcrowding and I have four points to make in three minutes so I'm going to speak quickly. Uh, first, uh, fast, cheap, and good. In project management there's a maxim, if you want it done fast, cheap, and good, you can't have all three, you have to pick two. And so if you want it fast and cheap, you, it won't be good, and so forth. And that's what I think we're up against here right now. It's striking a balance among faster, cheaper, and better solutions. So second, what do I mean by fast? I don't mean hasty. I mean not wasting time. I mean narrowing down the options of, uh, for middle school overcrowding by eliminating the ones that are just not feasible, securing the funding for these studies, doing the studies, and coming to a decision as, as soon as we can. Because the longer that we take, the greater the risk of two things. One, that certain options are no longer options because we took too long. 
For example, if renovating the Gibbs is taken off the table because a feasibility study can't be done by June, which is when the town needs to notify leaseholders about renewal or not. And second, there's a greater risk that whatever, subopti uh, that whatever suboptimal educational conditions are out there for our kids and that they'll be unnecessarily prolonged. Now, as for cheap, what do I mean by cheap? None of the options before us are cheap. We don't really know how much they'll cost. Last week, the facility subcommittee kept putting in a placeholder of about $30 million for each of the options. I know it's been refined a bit since then, but how rigorous are the, are the estimates? So I'd like to see a study done as soon as possible to get some real numbers for both capital costs and operating costs. Taking the Gibbs example again, for innovation costs, I've seen numbers of 30 million, 25 million, and the HMFH study that said 14 to 20 million. So from low to high, we're talking from 14 million to 30 million, that's a too wide a range. And we need to get that range narrowed down. As for operating costs, uh, for example, what's the difference in cost between running a larger Audison or running a smaller Audison plus a new Gibbs? Uh, the teachers are the teachers, no change there. Having two sc schools costs more because of incremental staff. On the other hand, there's savings as well because you don't have to have to, have to bus students from East Arlington to Audison. Again, we need to have hard numbers here. And why? Because the town authorities are very careful about spending the public's money and will only do so when, when all the homework has been done to compare the cost of the options. And finally, fourth, what do we, I mean by good? Again, fast, cheap, and good. Good, this may be hard to define, but I think we all know it when we see it. We want a quality educational experience for our students that prepares them well and that the town can be proud of. That's all I have. Thank you so much for your time and, and, and your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Mary Cummings. Uh, <coughs> we're gonna ask oh. She's the first chair. <coughs> well, Linda Hansen. <laughs> You signed it in that order, so Linda Hanson. Good evening, my name is Linda Hanson. I'm the president of the Arlington Education Association. Mm -hmm. And I wanna start out by congratulating Dr. Bodie and everyone else who worked on the application for the state funding for the high school on successfully attaining entrance into the next level of MSBA funding. It's incredibly exciting, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it later this mm -hmm. evening. The issue of state funding for our school building, though, is actually leads me to a topic I wanna to spend a few minutes talking about this evening. Like a lot of people, I've been thinking about the congruence of all of the costs of maintaining a high quality education in Arlington for the buildings, the personnel, the programs, and the curriculum materials. Like all of you, I have and will continue to participate in the many important meetings to attempt to come to a consensus to find the best way forward within the financial limitations we face. While we've been extremely focused most recently on working with funding decisions constrained by our local resources, the more time I've spent looking closely at the issues before us, the more I'm convinced that increasing funding at the state level by raising more revenue is the only thing that will really get us where we need to be. I know you're thinking along the same lines, and it was great to see our local representatives at the last school committee meeting. They're all strong advocates for our school. But it's pretty clear that without strong and impassioned advocacy, we will continue to have to rely on regressive local property taxes to fund our schools. I want to personally commit to expending time and energy in the upcoming months to help the parents that are so committed to educational excellence in our schools understand that in order to have smaller class sizes, neighborhood schools, differentiated curriculum, high achievement, and exciting learning experiences for our students, we will need to become more vocal and effective advocates for state funding. We will need to mobilize parents, community members, and town officials both inside Arlington and more importantly across the state. We have opportunities to do this before us now. The failure to capitalize on these initiatives and the failure to redirect some of the local energy to state level solutions will leave us all with less than we would like to see. We need to engage our friends and neighbors and our respective organizations around the concrete initiatives that we have before us. Um, I'm gonna name just three, charter school funding. Nothing new there, but Arlington is currently losing $100,000 to charter schools. This total reflects the amount of Chapter 70 aid that will be diverted from the school district to one or more charter schools, minus the total amount of state reimbursement the district is estimated to receive. This is for eight students who live in Arlington and attend a charter school. It may be a small number compared to what we need, but it represents about one and a half teachers. We need to support the Senate's efforts to revisit and revise how charter schools divert money from local school districts. 
Clearly more urban communities are suffering even more than Arlington. Our neighbors to the north and east stand to lose much more. Medford is slated to lose four million and Somerville seven million to charters in FY16. York Lowell, 14.7 million. Is that my timer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I have one minute of yours? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, fa the foundation budget. If new formulas are used from uh, the foundation budget, we, uh, Arlington would stand to gain $3.6 million. Um, local reps have talked about phasing in that idea, but without active, vocal, and organized support, we risk um, the report ending up on a shelf. The fair share millionaires tax, the 4% surcharge charge to income over a million dollars, would generate about $1.5 billion annually. I recently spent two hours talking to a neighbor about kind of the history of what's going on with the schools and local funding and why we're in the situation we're in. And at the end, I said, you know, we really need to look at state money and mention the millionaire's fair share tax. And she said, what's that? So I just feel like we need to, to draw those connections for people. Um, and, and also, I just want to encourage us all to activate ourselves, but most importantly, our respective communities across the state, MASS, MASC, MMA, MTA, we all need to work together on this. Thank you. Now to race. Go. Um, I'm Mary Cummings, uh, Arlington resident and speech and language pathologist at the Thompson School. Um, and at our recent Martin Luther King event, uh, Tito Jackson, Boston City Councilor and a, an extraordinary um, activist for justice and education. I know many of you were there and we saw him get uh, two big rounds of applause and at least one standing ovation when he asked us to help to keep the cap on charter schools. And he talked about the damage it's been doing in places like New Orleans, but we're just focusing tonight on the cost of it to, to us and our schools. Charters are approved by appointed, not elected, State Board of Education uh, members, regardless of the desires or resources of the districts that might be sending students and money to them. Charter schools are not held accountable to the local elected officials, including school committees, for how they spend our tax dollars or treat our children. Charter supporters are now investing about $18 million to either get our legislators to pass governor, the governor's bill to raise the cap or convince voters to pass the ballot question that would raise the cap. I think we're all in agreement that we want to um, keep that cap on. And we're concerned about the fact that most people know very little about charter schools or the impact they can have on our schools here in Arlington and we want to work together uh, to bring that to people's attention. I've given each of you a button uh, made by my own hands uh, that says public funds for public schools, and we're asking that you, or a surrogate, wear those buttons just doing errands, just to the grocery store, and we're just looking to get it out there so people can see something, so that when we call them or invite them to an information meeting, they'll have some idea that, oh, this is the kind of thing that, I, it's like the, the yard signs. I've seen that yard sign, this is a little bit familiar. So we wanna push them out now to make them familiar. And then we want to have some uh, community information meetings um, to help the community to understand what charter schools are because they think they only impact Boston and other urban areas. So uh, we've gotta work together and work hard. Can you imagine, I, if, if, we, if we cut down, cut out the option of charter schools. Then we would give the millionaires and billionaires a chance to prove that they really care about educating our kids. And they could take some of their $18 million and give it to us mm -hmm. instead of putting it in lobbying for charter schools. You just think of that. That's right on the button. Oh. <laughs> you go. Lisa Newmark. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lisa Newmark, and I have two children at Thompson. I've been following um, the enrollment um, challenge, um, challenges issues and have been attending the meetings. Um, and I just wanted to request that going forward, there's a more of a significant review and acknowledgement of what the evidence and research might say about the options that are on the table so that we understand what the trade-offs might be as the options are being evaluated. So for example, there's a tremendous amount of research about the impact of large schools and the potentially negative impacts, the impacts on increasing the number of school-to-school -school transitions and you know, a general consensus that ch 
children perform worse when there's a greater number of um, transitions. And I, I haven't really heard that being part of the framework of evaluation as we're going, as everyone's, you know, considering the feasibility of the options. And I'm seeing that, you know, other communities have, um, are dealing with the same issues, so there are these opportunities to learn from what others um, have done, and particularly the, the impact on students' learning and social development, um, um, social emotional development. And so going forward, I'd like to hear um, more of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tito Jackson was mentioned. Uh, and at the uh, Martin Luther King event, uh, we received a resolution from the legislature uh, that I read aloud at the uh, King event, but uh, the resolved statement is that Massachusetts General Court hereby commends the Arlington MECO program for 50 years of excellence and further extends its sincere best wishes for continued success and be it further resolved that a copy of these resolutions be transmitted forthwith by the clerk of the Senate to the Arlington METCO program. And so we are in receipt of this re resolution. Arlington is one of the original METCO towns. Uh, we were one of the towns that made it happen and uh, this was a tremendous source of pride for us mm -hmm. on the Martin Luther King uh, night as well as uh, an expression of gratitude from uh, uh, Councillor Jackson from Boston, so I'll pass around the resolution so you can read it as we uh, proceed on to the next item on the agenda, which is AHS Seal of Biliteracy. I'd like to introduce um, this evening our director of um, ELL, which is Carla Bruzese, and our director of world language, Catherine Ritz, who have both been here before. And they're here tonight to talk about a certificate program that they will be collaborating on going forward. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so we wanted to share with you an initiative um, that really spans the world language world and the ELL world to award um, recognition to students for developing proficiency in two languages, an English, lang uh, lang English obviously, and um, a second language. Um, I want to just give you a little background about this movement because it's really a national movement, the Seal of Biliteracy, and then Carla's going to go into some specifics of how we've developed the Seal um, that we'd like to pilot this year with our students at the high school. Um, so this movement started in California um, in 2011. The state passed um, an official uh, designation for a state seal of biliteracy. Um, it's now spread to 14 states that have official state seals, um, including um, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Texas, New Mexico, Indiana, and so on. Um, and then there are three states that currently have legislation um, pending. Um, to establish an official state seal, including Massachusetts. Um, so we're hopeful that um, this will be, uh, become an official sta state seal this year. Um, and the, in case you're curious, the, the legislation is called the Act to Establish a State Seal of Biliteracy. Um, so I've been collaborating uh, with some of the teacher organizations that I work with um, in a SEAL working group to develop state guidelines for the SEAL. And there's a number of districts um, throughout Massachusetts that are piloting the SEAL. Um, a few piloted last year and an increasing number are piloting this year. Um, for example, um, Melrose, Andover, um, and, and many more. Uh, Framingham, Holliston, uh, Boston is also public, uh, uh, piloting a SEAL. Um, so Carla and I have been working on this along with um, the, uh, one of the guidance counselors, Carolyn Lichter, and one of the Spanish teachers in my department, Christian Choro, to come up with, um, with guidelines. So I'll pass it over to you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Carla. Um, I'm actually really excited that this initiative is coming to Arlington because it is actually validating languages and literacy. So I was really excited when Catherine reached out to me if I knew anything about this. I'm also a member of the Matsall Professional Directors um, Association and they're jumping on board as well with uh, modern language and foreign language. So how we came up with um, 
our working group on the sale of biliteracy is that we'd like to award um, three different awards for biliteracy, a silver seal, a gold seal, and a platinum seal. And we have certain um, requirements and criteria for students to achieve these different levels and seals. The silver seal, um, we're looking at foreign language students that receive an intermediate or mid proficiency in English in their partner language. And for ELL students, we're looking for um, an access state score of a level four or higher. And for the gold seal, we're looking at intermediate high, which is and for a foreign language. And then for ELL, we're looking at a 4.5 on their state testing for English. And then in the platinum seal, we're looking at um, advanced low proficiency in English in their partner language. And then for ELL learners, we're looking for a level five. We have um, kind of collaborated um, using the guidelines from the state, but as well in our mini piloting group committee. Um, our criteria for English proficiency, we're looking at the MCAS scores for, for high school students for a 240 or above. And we're using the access scores for ELL learners um, to get that English proficiency. And then one of the following is also required for students to demonstrate a seal of biliteracy. Profi the proficiency um, demonstrated on a standardized assessment, um, the APPLE, the ACTFL assessment of performance toward proficiency in languages. It's available in Arabic, Chinese, French, German, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and in English. The cost is $20. Um, or the STAMP, standard based measurement of proficiency. It's available in um, Chinese, Arabic, French, Hebrew, Japanese, German, and Italian. The cost is $22. Or the ALERA, the Actful Latin Interpretive Reading Assessment, which is a cost of $10. We're still um, figuring out how um, actually the ELL directors are trying to figure out if we can use some Title III funding to, for students that have hardship, measure, hardship measures and can't pay the fees for these assessments. And um, or we're looking for either the assessment or a portfolio demonstration. And students would have to bring together three to five benchmark pieces of classwork or projects demonstrating the following in the student's second language for English for the ELL students and then for the foreign language students the, the proficiency in the language that they're targeting. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Yeah, another point I just wanted to stress is that this um, designation really emphasizes proficiency. It's not a seat, bait, a seat time um, a certif certification. So we really feel like that's an important piece um, to emphasize that we can honor um, ELL students who bring a really rich background and proficiency in their home language that they that is honored in the school and um, students of foreign language who've developed a, a high level proficiency in in the language that they've been studying at school. Um, we then are we're planning on piloting it, uh, rolling this out to students this year for our current junior class and then the following uh, fall awarding students. We have these lovely medals that we would give students for graduation and um, I have a little present for everyone it's, and I won't hold you to this. This is um, a little bumper sticker. I won't make you put it on your car but in case you would like it, it's a, I support the state seal of biliteracy. Um, so I'll pass these around. Um, and just really briefly, and then I'd love if you have any questions for us, um, Carla and I are collaborating a lot this year. We're also working on, um, uh, thanks to the guidance of Dr. Bodhi, um, a global competency um, program at the high school. Um, so that's really under works. We have just a draft um, out guideline, but that's also an initiative that's in a number of um, local districts. It started in Needham High School. Um, and it's kind of a, an academic program where there's certain courses that you want to see the students have take. Have take. Um, you want to see some foreign language uh, proficiency, and then they also have to do um, a, a global engagement research project. Um, we hope that it would also include a travel component. So we'd love to come back when that's really flushed out and present it to the school committee as well. So if you have any questions, we're happy to address them. Mr. Pierce. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, I definitely support this program from what I've seen on the website and what you've given us. It seems like such a great added benefit uh, for our students who are going on to college. Perhaps they could put that in their applications, that they were awarded such a designation. Mm -hmm. My question is really sort of in the future for our district, what you think about um, starting with proficiency and students with languages earlier than middle school and how we can, how we can get there. Music to her ears. <laughs> how can we get there? 
yes, well, I, I would defer to Dr. Bode and Dr. Chesna. I am 100% um, in support of that initiative. I know we both are. I would so. be too. <laughs> we could start even in preschool. Because I'd love to see these people get, these students get awards in, in fifth grade rather and, than. And they uh, ac yeah, they actually have, a, I, we started with the high school one, but there is a middle school um, seal as well, but we just decided to start in the high school. So uh, let us know what we can do. <laughs> Again, thank you very much. Uh, I have two grandchildren in the Spanish Immersion Program in Maine. How many other towns are doing what you're doing? Or is, is this a growing? Let me, I, I don't need to know the exact amount of number. Yeah. But it, it's a growing thing throughout the state. Yeah, it's growing throughout the state. Mm -hmm. D does it have any, uh, I don't mean to be materialistic about it, but succeeding on this, does this goes on their permanent record going forward to college and stuff like that? Does it have any effect or is the program still just too new to? Uh, we, we had, ex so uh, in some states they actually put a sticker, like a certification on the actual transcript or have it written on the transcript. It, with um, Carolyn Lichter representing the guidance department, we decided in our initial year, most schools are, they have digital applications, so a, a sticker wouldn't make that much of a difference. Right. Um, and we, we decided let's wait and make sure this program is successful before we start looking at ways to get it actually printed on the transcript through PowerSchool. So we decided to wait on that one, but we, possibly. Is there enough evidence to make a determination how receiving schools are, are responding to it? Universities? At universities? I don't think we have that information yeah. quite yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I'm confident, I mean, assuming that this gets passed in the legislature and becomes an official state seal, um, I think we'll see it grow increasingly in, in more and more schools. Thank you. I don't know why you're doing seals. We don't have a harbor. Can we do river otters? <laughs> uh, no, this, this, is, this is a wonderful thing, and uh, to add that recognition in for... Uh, for students who achieve biliteracy, I think it's a wonderful thing. We have such a diverse population uh, and so many languages being spoken in our schools and in our town and in my home. I'm an illiterate in my own home. I can't read mm -hmm. more than half the books, but that's okay. <laughs> You're not gonna fix that for me. Uh, but uh, I wish you well and uh, please come back if there's anything else we can do for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your time. Next item would be today's students, tomorrow's teachers, and with an update, Mr. Spiegel. Okay, thank you. Um, so as you know, uh, for the past several years, Arlington participated in the Today's Students, Tomorrow's Teachers, or TSTT program. The mission of the uh, program is to recruit, mentor, and train culturally diverse and econ economically challenged students from high school through college and place them as effective teachers and committed leaders in the schools and communities. It's a pipeline program to start students in high school thinking about careers in education and follow them through college and hopefully return to teach in your school district. In, in, um, it's part of our effort to um, recruit more teachers of color into our classrooms. Um, it's a career development model that does increase culturally diverse educators in schools. It's a program that's been going on in New York State and. Uh, for more than 20 years. It was founded in Westchester County um, in 1994. Um, and in the 2011-12 school year, it was expanded into the greater Boston area with four school <coughs> districts, Arlington, Andover, Brookline, and Lexington. Um, at the end of the 2014-15 school year, those four school districts had their first cohort of seniors graduate. And there was an event in June uh, at Leslie University where our students were awarded, um, you know, were recognized for graduating. Um, at the end of that, of the last school year, there were some changes among the member districts here. Lexington had decided prior to the end of the school year that they were going to withdraw and not continue in the program past the end of, the, of last school year. And over the summer, Andover reached the same conclusion. They, they withdrew from the program. So that left Brookline and Arlington which was made it impossible for the organization nationally to fund a program manager to run the program here in our area. And um, because of that uncertainty and not having the stability of the program, we didn't recruit a new cohort of students and neither did Brookline. So we have um, one student who was remaining from, the pro from last year who was now a senior and Brookline had a few students who remained and um, so we've been trying to figure out what we're gonna do going forward. 
for the students who remain in the program and in the future if we're going to continue. Um, on Tuesday, Dr. Bodhi and I had a conference call with uh, Dr. Betty Perkins, who is the founder and executive director of TSTT and her husband. Um, they are interested in resuming a, a cohort in a region here next year. They've been reaching out to districts nearby like Waltham and Medford and some others uh, about joining and they're hopeful that they and other districts nearby will join. A lot of this is dependent on the district's budget process. Uh, like us, everyone's in budget season and trying to figure out what makes it into the budget. This program does cost the district $3,000 per student per year. So depending on how many students we have, it's, uh, that's how much we pay. And the goal of the program and the way it works in a lot of the, in Westchester County where it's really, where it was started and where there's several school districts that are very involved in it, they have a cohort in every class in the high school. So you could have a school with 20 to 25 students and you're paying $3,000 each. Some of those schools have sponsors, they have corporate sponsors in New York that are paying for some of that, which we have not had here. Um, so we're, we're looking at if these other districts do join um, and we can develop a cohort of 40 to 50 students in our general region, which would probably take five to eight school districts to do. Um, then we, Dr. Bodhi and I talked to Dr. Perkins that we would um, continue, we'd, we'd come back into the program, try to recruit students for next year um, who would be underclassmen, freshmen, maybe sophomores at the high school here um, and, and start again. Um, as you know, we're involved in the Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education. We're a member district. Regina Keynes, who is the director of that um, organization, has been very vocal in her support of uh, TSTT and have, has spoken to the member districts of MPDE to try to get some interest in uh, TSTT through those districts. Um, and perhaps some of those districts will come on board. It's a little uncertain right now. I think we do need to have, get other districts on board. Brookline is also in a little bit of a transition right now because they're going through a superintendent search. They have a new human resources director. So um, the people who were involved in the program when Brookline, in Brookline when it was created there are not there anymore, other than the teachers who have still been involved. Um, so that's really where we are. We're sort of in a, in a sort of a lull this year with the program and mostly, you know, because of the uncertainty of the, the program here in our district, in our region, we weren't able to gain new, new districts in, through until last year. Boston was start, talking about starting, but that kind of fell through. Worcester, had their own uh, thing going, and uh, I don't think that's going to continue in the same way anymore after this year. Um, so it's a little bit, it's been a tougher for this program to get traction in, our, in, in Massachusetts. Um, and so we're sort of beholden to what other districts we can get involved because we do need uh, other towns, other school districts in our general area to be involved, for us to be involved, for it to, make worth, to be worthwhile to engage a program manager who's going to work with the districts in really running an effective program here. I don't know if Kathy has anything to Great, great summary. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hainer? First off, I don't know if you remember, I was fortunate enough to represent us at that uh, graduation program at Leslie last year and it was, seeing the, the young students, it was phenomenal. I value this program. A Couple of questions for you. That $3,000, how much of that goes to the national? So we, uh, we send it to the national. So every, the $3,000 the $3, goes to the national. What they do with the money is they pay a regional program manager, they create curriculum, they obviously have overhead at their, region, at their national office, which is in White Plains, New York. Um, so they, it's, you know, it's part of the organizational expenses. Second question, mm -hmm. yeah. they don't have a copyright. For, I mean, what would it take for us to consider doing it on our own? So there are dealing with the cost. I think, the, correct me if I'm wrong, the biggest part is money, second, having that director do the organization part. Uh, we, could you pri prioritize, is it money well, first, would you say? I think it's money. $12,000 for a student that comes in the freshman year going right. through the whole program. I, I think it's money and time. So each school district also has a teacher mentor. And we have had a teacher mentor here, uh, Melanie Kosendakis, who's a social studies teacher here at the high school, who's done a great job as a teacher mentor uh, for our students here at the high school. 
they, the teacher mentor gets a stipend actually directly from TSTT program. It's not through our contract, it's right. through the TSTT program. And so they get a little stipend to, to work with the students, but it's not enough to make it that, and they don't have time or capacity. We'd have to, cre we'd have to sort of create a part-time position to allow them to do that in Arlington and release them from some of the teaching duties. Uh, so there would be an expense to that to make it worthwhile. I didn't know if we could start our own, just a thought, a smaller consortium of several towns. I, from what I've heard, because I've been active in this with the others, the dissatisfaction is the support of the, the major chapter because we had, correct me if I'm wrong, we, did we ever have a full-time director? We never had a full-time director okay. in our region and, because and we didn't have enough students to right, support Right, and we it. had several directors going in and out of this? Over the course of the four years, we had three or four directors. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, the, there's a factor of consistency and stuff like that. I'm not trying to add more work or, or stuff like that, but... To me, the program is worth it. If we can make it survive, if we have to possibly cre be creative, it's easy for me to say this uh, and hard to go through, but that's part of it. And so just throwing that out there. Yeah, I'm not sure the mm -hmm. cost. I mean, I think it would, cre would require a part-time position to run the program but we um, might, effectively. We've never investigated, and I'm not putting any blame on this or on anyone, never investigated corporate sponsors in the area, have we? Well. We have not. That would be the role of the director. But the the issue of having other districts and having a director is that it's, there are programs that they attend. And so it's organizing these educational programs. There's certainly things they do in district. But um, that would be, a, a, I think that would not be really realistic in terms of what we could possibly reach out to. It would need this outside organization. And we support them in... And I, and I will certainly talk with any superintendents that they have, have interest in this program. But I think without TSTT organizing all the programmatic pieces of this, we, we just simply don't have the, the personnel to do that. I just got the feeling that the support, because we did not have a full-time director, was there all the time. I spoke to several, two of the uh, part-timers, and they, they would be getting information late, uh, some of the program, the students had already committed to something else. Mm -hmm. it, it was very frustrating. The, the concept right. of the program is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And there was a degree of frustration. That, that's where I'm coming from. That. That's all. Yeah. Th there, I've, I've heard that too. And I think one of the other issues that um, can be, the program is demanding. It's a rigorous, rigorous curriculum that the TSTT, they have their curriculum that they set up. They have a lot of expectations for the students to do uh, internships and tutoring and things like that. Um, and when you have students like we do in Arlington and a lot of the other districts do too who are involved in athletics and, and clubs and, and part-time jobs and whatever, it's very difficult to fit it all in. I mean, our, as you know, our students are extended in this high school and many high schools in, in Massachusetts and have a lot going on. And it's another thing that is, is very useful and helpful, but it's just hard to get it all in. If I may, just one more, the benefit of one of the students that finished the program would, in the next four, the next four years at Leslie, was gonna cost that student something like $2,500 a year, including books, tuition, and room and board. Scholarships through Barnes and Noble, the, I mean, the, the, the main program has a lot of connections and stuff, so extremely beneficial for these right. young people. They earned it. They earned every bit of it, but uh, I was just astounded at what uh, these people were gaining in the work. Mm -hmm. that they the, the one other thing that is a challenge for the students, I mean, one of the, the things that the program does is it has college partnerships, and so as you were saying, that the students can get a very good, at least 50, at least 50 percent off tuition primarily, or a 50 percent scholarship for the colleges that are partners with TSTT. The only local college that was really a partner was Lesley University, and that's been a recent development. I think they've talked to other colleges around here to try to add them. The limitation of the colleges, there's more in the New York area um, and some other um, in Westchester County and other upstate New York, um, but not as, uh, if, the, if that would increase, that would help too. And, and a lot of our students, are, there's other sources that they're getting um, college funding from. Dr. Seuss. Oh, um, I, I'm very sad to hear this, and I just have to say that it just sounded like such a fabulous program, mm -hmm. um, and I hope that things work out, that we can restart it in the future. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, anything else? No? Nope. Uh, vote for approval, second read of the 2016-2017 Arlington Public Schools calendar. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bodie, uh, we have a calendar before us, You right? have a calendar before you. Essentially, this calendar um, identifies what the start date is of the school year, uh, major vacations, major holidays, of course, the early release time we have on Tuesdays for elementary. Uh, so pretty much all of the essential information is in this calendar. What it does not have right now is um, perhaps your approval on what the dates are for the school committee meetings, because mm -hmm. we just put them in based on the policy, which sometimes, given other conflicts, those dates get changed around a bit. And also, we don't have parent conferences on here at any of the levels, yeah. or if there are early release days at the secondary level. We will be able to have that information by the end of the school year, which we did last year. And so we'll do an updated calendar at that time. But I think parents um, are very, um, uh, would like very much to know what the key times are for next year. And our hope is that we're going to be able to do that for, say, the next two years after that. Um, I know the Community Relations uh, Committee, Subcommittee, and the AEA are going to do a joint survey just to get a sense from parents of uh, some issues around the start time and maybe some other things that they're going to talk about. Because I, would, I think it would be helpful par parents before the end of this school year to know the opening school date for... 2017 and 2018 if we can do that. Obviously, there'll be incomplete calendars, but it's getting the key times in there. Mr. Hainer. I would ask the superintendent uh, to ask all the principals and stuff, programs such as the one that's going on in the low auditorium right now, not be scheduled for Thursday night unless it's an absolute emergency. There are too many programs. I think that would be, it's very important for it, members of the school committee to, to have a presence. And uh, a lot of them have, have fallen on Thursday night. Tonight is, is one that I truly wanted to go to. I asked if it was going to be videotaped, but it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I would ask going forward, I mean, there was some talk of changing the night. I think the, I don't know which is easy, for us to change our night or for programs not to be scheduled on the night that we're meeting. That's what I'd ask you to do going forward, please. Well, I certainly will. Uh, and I. Sometimes it has to do with this, when the speaker can come. There's a lot of other factors involved. And, and also when we've had some actual school events, whether they be parent <coughs> conferences, the, the preference is clearly to have it more toward the end of the week because when teachers have a long day of teaching and are out in the evening, it, it's better when it's toward the end of the week rather than the beginning of the week. So th those are some issues that have always been... Uh, then maybe the conversation needs to go forward changing our night. I don't know. Well, we've, we've already referred that to policies and procedures, but uh, seeing that we meet we twice a month. I don't see it's going to happen in this calendar, so that's why no. I'm, I'm, well, you, well, But going well, forward, there's a discussion. Well, with, well, the problem with the conferences is that we have very few options for school committee meetings in December and very few Thursdays. And uh, so to the extent that we can schedule around the committee meetings, which is helpful then to get them on the calendar, we'll certainly try to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I'm going to move approval of the calendar with the understanding that it's going to be amended with... Uh, filled in. Filled in, rather. Filled in. Mm -hmm. But this gives parents uh, the start date and the end date for the year. Mm -hmm. Second. A second by Ms. Starks. Uh, Dr. Allison Appy. I don't have anything on the current calendar, but I'm very glad to hear that we're talking about getting the next calendars set earlier because we've been talking about doing that for years and we really need to do it. Yeah. It, it yes. messes people up. Yes. Um, any other discussion on the motion? Dr. Seuss? Oh, no. oh just to clarify, uh, so we still have the option in the future calendars, not this year of course, of um, changing the date. If we no, vote we can, to no, no, we can change changing it. the date of the school committee meeting. We can even change it this year. Yeah. We can oh, do well, school committee meetings aren't set. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So just our, yeah, our policy allows us to set them on our policy allows us to choose the Thursdays that they will be on. 
And if we want to amend our policy to remove either 6.30 or Thursday, we may do that. Yeah. And that is before the Policies and right. Procedures right. Okay. Committee right That's now. separate from this. So, That's this, separate. this so we approve this as is, and yeah. we don't yeah. commit to ourselves. We're not committing yeah. to anything Great. other okay. than the start and the end. Mm -hmm. okay. And the early releases and stuff. Yeah, the early releases are set, too, but that could change. If, mm -hmm. Okay. If you change the PD calendar, professional development, right? right or the, or I think that we're going to well, try to keep those in place, right? Well, next year, I mean, the, the professional day, mm -hmm. that ha absolutely has to be on the day of the presidential mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, you should, uh, there's an agreement we have with, with the, the clerk's office that when we have major elections, that would be our PD day because mm -hmm. it's just a, it's, it works out better because there's so many yeah. people that are coming to the yeah. schools. Yeah. 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 But I think the, the calendar will be filled in with more information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after we approve it. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's the unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, uh, next will be... Uh, Fiscal 17 budget, what are Arlington Public Schools' priorities? Uh, Superintendent. All right. Um, you were, when we first began this discussion of the budget, you've heard from principals, um, and we've certainly had a number of meetings with administrators looking at what are the essential things that we need for our school district to provide the services that this community has con has expected of our schools. And we sh shared with you a list um, that totaled about $3.8 million. Of that, we were able to see that in terms of our past formula for going forward, that we would probably have $500,000 that we could put toward that amount, bringing it down to roughly 3.3. Since, um, since then, we've been given a, the number uh, by the town manager and in fact this evening we do need a vote on that number so going forward so that that is one thing that will happen and I and I believe that we have the, the motion and the number for that I have the number yeah have okay the well we can get to that in a, in a minute that but we have spent some time um, over the last couple of weeks since we were given that number and uh, and what we would take of that list and what we would say would be, from our point of view, from the administrator's point of view and teacher's point of view, I, I would also say that we would put forward to come to the dollar amount, which basically comes to about $1.5 million. Of that $1.5 million, 500 of that is the money that we would have from the formula for town appropriation. 250 of that would be from our revolving accounts. And then the remaining amount of money is, is part of the change in the formula for next year that goes to the 35% of per pupil for enrollment growth. And um, that differential between our current formula, which is 25% and 35%, 10% over the last three years. So essentially, it's in the neighborhood of about 950,000. So we have given you what we think are the priorities for that. Um, uh, Ms. Johnson has been working on preparing the, the budget documents for use, and that has to go to the printer tomorrow, so you have it next week. But this is the opportunity now and over the next couple of meetings to have some discussion about those to see if there are different priorities that you might have as a committee. Um, so that's what, what's one of the beginning discussions. What, what will come from this meeting, however, will not be reflected in any documents that have to go out tomorrow, pretty much, because it, that's all has to do with, it's already pretty much there to go to the printer. We did get some very unexpected and good news today, however. Um, I was at a, the midwinter, the mid-year conference with, with um, superintendents this morning, and uh, Commissioner Chester announced that something that none of us knew about, that the governor was proposing um, to, a, a way to encourage more districts to have a full-time kindergarten without fees, and has proposed that districts that have that 
would be given $350 per student that would be used supplementary. It would, it would, we could not supplant anything, working pretty much like how Title I works. So it would be supplementary. And if that does happen, uh, we would be very close, about twenty to $30,000 shy of what it would take to have full-time teaching assistants at the, in the kindergartens. So we won't know that until the budget's finally passed, but um, I heard about it, and we, and, and, uh, we immediately, Julie Dunn immediately called the <laughs> Department of Education. We were the first district to call <laughs> to find out, is this really true? And apparently so. It's a different kindergarten grant extension than what we previously had had. So it's an entirely different initiative, which is supplanting with the, the old version. So that was a, a piece of good news. And the other is that we would have a little bit more in the way of Chapter 70, not a lot. Um, and I believe that you think that that would come to about um, $1,000. No. I heard about 120000 right. thrown around. I mean, I, I would hope that we'll use it to fund reserve positions. Yeah. Um, I, I no, you don't. We, no. This is all very new information since you were, since that was put into your um, yeah, Novus box. Okay. Um, I, I would just say that the Chapter 70 increase was paltry. Um, and I think uh, the first thing I did when I saw those numbers is I called the governor's office to complain and then called uh, the rep and the senators uh, to complain as well. And I, you know, it, it sort of puts us in a peculiar position in that we do have two reps and a senator who are very solid behind us. But one of the really important things to have up on Beacon Hill is their ability to hold a stack of mess phone messages of outrage from their constituents over uh, th this Chapter 70 change. And uh, the Foundation Budget Review Commission talked about how underfunded the Foundation Budget was. And so now we have a governor who inflates it at negative 0.022%. So he's cutting the uh, foundation budget uh, rather than increasing it. So that it's leaving us with about a 1.5% increase in our chapter 7, or, or actually it's a 1% increase in the chapter 70 aid with a 1.5% increase in, in, in students. And it's, it's totally unjustifiable. And I think that anyone within the sound of this voice uh, our union friends, our parents, needs to call, make three phone calls tomorrow, one to the governor's office and one to their, to their rep or senator, uh, uh, either Mr. Garbley or Mr. Rogers, and fill their phone messages with complaints about the, the disinvestment. Because what's going on here, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't be talking like this, but it's, 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 it's egregious that uh, the state has the ability to raise revenues, but they've taken it off the table, and they've taken away our ability to raise any kind of revenues locally. Massachusetts municipalities are the most restricted municipalities in the nation in terms of their ability to raise rev revenue locally. So all the state is doing with this budget, or all the governor is, because the legislature hasn't adopted it, is proposing to pass the problem on to, to, to local school districts. And that, that's irresponsible to go and uh, balance your budget on the back uh, and turn the problem over to somebody else. And I, I think it's egregious. Um, uh, Mr. Hainer. Dr. Bodie, why are we voting tonight? And what is it exactly we're voting that you're asking us to vote on? The number that the town has given, gave us last week? For appropriations, yes. At a later date, can we raise it after we vote? Can we raise yeah, it? Is this, is this this vote tonight, does it lock us into that that number? That it's accepting the number. I, I have a little bit of a concern, if I may. Go right ahead. I have a concern about that because in the uh, budget meeting that we had yesterday, uh, the idea was the, the initial budget is your budget. We're formulating our budget. It sounds like we're adopting the budget or we're going to have to take cuts within it and, and be restrained by the, the, the top, top money. And I'm a little bit nervous of that. What happens if we don't accept it tonight? I'm not saying we're not going to accept it. But what happens if we don't accept it tonight? Anything? 
this isn't the mandatory acceptance of the budget. That, that the, we have a certain date that we have to accept the budget prior to town meeting. I'm just concerned that this puts restraints on the committee to increase if we, if we come to a consensus to increase. I'm not saying that we're going to, but I'm just nervous about that. Well, this is the number that um, has emerged from long-range planning uh, in terms of what, what would seem to be a reasonable number going forward. I think that, putting this in context, I think everyone acknowledges that we are going to be going to the voters for debt exclusion overrides on, on a number of projects, which, one of which I will talk about tonight, the high school. And we are also looking down the road at an operating um, override. Um, the town has been, has been done an excellent job in being able to take the past override and have it extend many years. And part of that ability was actually through the uh, employees of the town agreeing to go into GIC, plus some additional monies that came through the, the, the budget process at the state. But we are, that is not going to go on indefinitely. And so when they're looking at the money that we would use for operating budgets for the, up through the next three years or whatever number of years, they want to do it with the eye toward what is a reasonable operating override. I, I understand that and I appreciate all the work that's been done by you, Ms. Johnson and the Long Range Planning Committee and everything. But in the, the budget process that we're going through, we're, we're doing outreach right now to the, each of the schools and stuff. And part of that is to ask parents and different groups to communicate with us their needs and their priorities. By voting this tonight, my concern is those meetings are fairly hollow other than if a, parents, a group of parents say, we would like you to increase this or we'd like you to support this, it means we then, or you, have to cut something out if we make that a priority. And, and not that it, it will be 100% funded, but it, it makes it to me just the, an act of futility in my mind. That's all I'm saying. Can I, can I respond? Uh, procedurally? Uh, all right, no, okay. Um, are you? Oh, I was just saying procedurally, you asked me what yes. this would mean. Um, the only way that that number to, that bottom line number would change would be if the finance committee recommended a different number to town meeting or um, the committee went to town meeting and asked for more money. Uh, Ms. Starks. Yeah, so I think that we're not voting the buckets, we're just voting the number. Like we always do every January, we have to vote to accept the final number. This, this is, is the a, final number. This is a lot earlier than we normally do. No, 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 this is not. At the end of January? Yes, yeah. always, yeah. First meeting of January. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Again, um, can, can yeah. we not yeah. engage in cross You're right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Thielman? I think we have to vote to accept the number <clears throat> tonight. And, and, uh, I'm trying to understand, are we going to go, do you want to talk about the, the, the cuts uh, or are we going to, or, should we, or, should, or should we make a motion to get the number, do you want to get that done first? Uh, I, we, we can have a motion before us to vote the number, Okay. Uh, but uh, the discussion can go on the, into on the, the impact the, of it so that our debate on whether or not to approve that motion to accept the number that's been offered to us can be informed by the discussion. And I'll, I'll put the motion on the table. There'll be a second, then I'll ask questions. I'll second okay. it. Okay, so I move, what's the number that we accept? The number is? The total. 50. Mr. Thielman? <laughs> oh, you're gonna read it, you might as well have it. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Uh, <clears throat> so, I move that the school committee accepts uh, the following uh, allocation from the town for our budget for fiscal year 17, 57 million, 1,333 dollars. Okay. And a second by Mr. Hainer. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Thielman continue followed by the chair of the budget <clears throat> subcommittee. Oh. You go ahead, Mr. Is that Thielman, okay? okay. You so made the motion. Yeah, okay. And I, so I just, um, so I'm going, I went through the, uh, the list of the cuts and uh, I, the document is titled, uh, 
color coded FY7. So I'm looking at FY17 color coded ask cuts for ask uh, cuts for 17. Um, okay. <clears throat> the, so I see um, under Addison uh, teachers a cut in one teach uh, SLCB SLCB uh, teaching assistants. So what's the so are we what's what's the plan for SLC given these cuts at the Addison? Can I defer this over to Ms. Elmer? Yeah. Um, we would not be increasing staffing. They would stay with their existing staff. And so how many SLC classrooms would it? Um, so the model at the middle school is a little bit different than the model at the elementary school. Okay. So it's not a completely sub-separate where a classroom all day, the students go their periods throughout the day. There's yeah. only a special education teacher, two um, TAs, they're paraprofessionals, and a licensed social worker. So what would the, what's the impact going to be on that change and from what we asked? Um, if there are program referrals, obviously the class size during those periods will increase. The social worker will have a larger caseload. Um, okay. All the collateral work that you do around these students who have social emotional needs, working with outside providers and whatnot, would increase on two individuals that we currently have. Okay. Um, next area, uh, <coughs> uh, under the elementary Cuts, um, and that's Stratton Hardy Bishop district wide teaching. There's Stratton Hardy Bishop teachers, um, and they were one was an ELL, two were ELL teachers, and one was a reading specialist. Mm -hmm. What's the? Could someone just describe the impact of that? Um, we would um, have a larger number of students that have to be serviced by um, the ELL teachers. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at, particularly at Hardy. Um, is whether we, if we have uh, other elementary teachers that are hired, and the same thing at, Stra uh, at Thompson, to see if we can obtain um, dual certified teachers, um, so that those students, you know, that would help us with man managing the caseload in terms of the ELL. Um, in terms of the reading specialist, um, we do currently have a situation where we have to prioritize the students that receive reading services. Um, we are currently not able to, ser uh, to service all the students that we might like to have reading services, mm. and this will increase that to some degree. Thank you. Um, Audison, uh, world language, uh, Spanish, French, one, one FTE, or I'm sorry, 0 0.8 FTE. That means that, is that means larger class sizes are not offering, what's the, what's the trade off? Certainly larger class sizes, but um, you know, Dr. Bodie has a policy at the high school regarding the minimum number of students that are necessary for to be in a course in order to run it. Now this so, is middle, middle school. Right, I, I understand. I, I was going to just say that we're going to yeah. probably have to use the same kind of um, uh, guidelines. At, I got it. Similar yeah. guidelines at the middle school. Okay. Well, I will add one, one more thing. One of the constraints we've had with world language at the middle school this year is the size of the classrooms they've been in. Yeah. And uh, we're probably going, which constrains the number of students. So class sizes will rise, but it's also going to mean that some classes are going to have to move to other rooms uh, and have more traveling for world language teachers. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and the one thing I did want to point out is I think I got this right. Um, the science kits, that's, that's saved. I didn't get yes. right. So we're going to do. Yeah, the materials are all the same. Yeah. We're going to take that out of revolving money. That's so that's a one time expense. Yeah. Okay. And out of the revolving reserve fund. Right. Of, right now we're take, planning to take 250000 Okay. So the, the one, so that's a good thing in some respects. Another thing, it, it, in another respect, it's a little dangerous because then we get, we get used to that. That's a concern. It, we there are certainly expenses that come up that are unexpected. Yeah. The elevator is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because there are certain things that that we're going to have to fund. There's one could argue as to what is the right percentage to have in you keeping your revolving accounts with with a budget this size, mm -hmm. the number of students we have, and, and frankly, I think we're 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 concerned. We're fine mm -hmm. um, with the numbers we have right now. To have no reserves is not good, prudent management. 
of a, of a school district this size. It's just not. And so having something in the order of 2%, I think, is a reasonable number. Okay. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, okay. So I'm sorry I wasn't here last time, and I'm behind on meetings, and I'm still playing catch-up, and also I'm not 100%, but I'm doing my best. First, when we have voted before um, on this, what we have phrased it as, at least in the recent past, is we acknowledge the number that we were given. Acknowledge. So I'll take the friendly amendment. <laughs> so instead of accept, acknowledge. Yes. Mm -hmm. better. Because better. It, certainly it sits better, better with mm -hmm. us. Um, so the second thing is we did have a we had a meeting yesterday um, with the budget subcommittee. One of the things that we brought up was whether we we had heard about the town's funding and the numbers that were coming down. And so one of the obvious questions is do, as Mr. Hainer was saying, do we just accept it or do we keep pushing back? And what I found was that the budget subcommittee itself was very divided mm -hmm. and I didn't feel that we could come to a resolution um, so we don't bring forward anything um, in terms of a specific recommendation, either accept or not. Um, I felt it was better just to have us all make our own statements about what we thought. Um, I'll wait and get back to what my thinking is on this. Um, so the... That's really what it comes down to is whether we acknowledge and accept the number or whether we try and push forward. There really isn't much precedent for us pushing forward. In fact, there wasn't really precedent for us pushing what we did. Um, so it's hard to say how will it fit into budgets and, and things, you know, clearly budgets are still flexible. I mean, things are being decided until town meeting, but there are so many other balls in the air also, and we were having to look and think about all of these things at the same time and pick what is the best option for all of them. <laughs> um, and it gets very complicated. Um, I appreciate that you were eliciting the feedback on what the meaning is of not having these things. As we communicate out to parents, um, we're, we will bring some of this information to them. Uh, to speak to Mr. Hainer's point about well, what's the point in going and talking to parents, um, part of what we're doing Budgeting is always a zero-sum game. It's figuring out what parts within that zero-sum, what parts do we keep and what parts do we shrink and what parts do we grow. And what we're trying to hear from the parents is our, our think, is our thinking in line with what their desires are. Um, and so I don't feel that there is no reason to go talk to people if we've already accepted a bottom line number. Mm -hmm. um, and just to clarify, as we were having sort of side talk, this is the usual, actually the last meeting was the one that we normally acknowledge the number. Um, and it's always in way, way in advance of our budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that's because of the way the town does it with the long range plan and, mm -hmm. and going forward. I think in other situations, it may be somewhat different. Um, but I think it is, important for us to continue going forward and collecting information from parents but also I had asked last last for last meeting to gather school committees thoughts on what priorities were and I think that message got kind of garbled so we are still interested in hearing what you f folks are thinking or what you're hearing from people so that we can go forward and look look at what the decisions are and, and think about them in that light. Am I done? Ms. Starks is next. 
Um, I had a, a bunch of questions. Um, my first question was, I assume that the increase um, early childhood asked for two TAs and they're getting three. I assume that's because they're not getting the teacher. Okay. Um, and then initially in the, um, I noticed that we only had one reserve teaching position, but in this new one that's available tonight, the color-coded one, we have two reserve teachers. Dr. Bodie. I don't know how that changed. We have one, unless you put in the, we put, you put the two in because yes, of the, the uh, chapter seven. Oh, that, I wondered where it came from. the professional, the last of the professional. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. They All had right, a, uh, they had a, um, a meeting eight. about this. This has really been go Oh, no, I know. Yeah, we, we, I'm we sure. Felt, yeah, we, we're feeling very uncomfortable at the number of reserve positions, as you can well understand. This last year, we had eight. Yes. And That's why I was concerned, because yeah. we initially had asked for five, then it was cut back to right. one, but now I see it's back up to two, which I feel a little bit more comfortable with, but I just wondered where that came from in that. If I could, it's two on top of the two that we've automatically allocated to Thompson to staff the two. Okay. Right, right, right. So right. it's actually four ads. Well, okay. well we also have at allocated one to Hardy. Mm -hmm. One and of those two reserve one ones. Of, one of the two reserve ones? At least one. Yeah. We have, a, we're going to need, a, we're going to need one or possibly two teachers at Hardy next year. The second teacher will depend upon what happens with kindergarten enrollment. Okay. All right. So that's what those are for. Yes. Okay. But we put the two so for Thompson. So nothing Thompson here is. for PE. For PE? Yes. No. They asked for more PE. The Audison there is. Yeah, we have that Not at the Audison. Audison. No, the elementary yeah. school. Elementary. The problem is the overcrowding in the elementary school PE classes. Okay. Um, the other question I have is translation asked for 10,000, so you gave them 11,589. That was to hit the, the number exactly. Ah, okay. In um, addition, that's actually kind of low. It's way low anyway, but okay. that was, I needed something to tie us out. Okay. Um, and then I wondered, you, I'm excited that we're going to put another nurse at the Audison, given the number of kids there. Um, and I just, I noticed that their original ask was for, $68,600, but we're only giving them 54000 but we're still keeping the FTE the same. Do we just find a cheaper nurse? Well, that's exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> Director Franke told us that she could find somebody for that price, and oh, okay. so we lowered oh, the amount. Okay. Good, good, good. All right, excellent. Um, I mean, of course, I feel just like everyone else. I have, I'm sure that, I mean, it's heart-wrenching, the stuff that we can't do. Um, but... I mean, I understand that the decisions that had to be made, I don't think that I could make them any differently. So I just wanted to make sure I understood what was done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Pierce. Thank you. Um, was one of the considerations the amount of X's in the four columns on the left, if there, if there were four X's, <laughs> that that would get the funding before the... Uh, more X's. <laughs> equals no. more, more dollars. Okay. One of, the, one of the things that I'm concerned about with the Common Core, you know, is that the teachers' professional development of Common Core is getting uh, not funded at all, support for Common Core implementation. And we're also, the elementary math coach and the reading um, is, is uh, for example, the elementary math coach is 0.2 instead of 1.6. Um, if we're not gonna have the teachers having their professional development and we're not gonna have the coaches that we need, it, it, you know, we're switching to a test that is all Common Core, it just seems like something's gonna not be right in that equation. So I, I just want to know. Well, I can have Dr. Chesson chime in on this too, but I will say we've been doing a lot of work on Common Core. Professional development is an extremely important investment that we make in our teachers because that's how our students benefit. Um, as we go forward with this, we're, we'll hope that they'll be able to offer more. The thing to remember about a budget is that it's a blueprint. It's, it's not exact to the dollars because you can't do it until you go through, and that's what you see in the actuals the year goes on. So we're hoping that um, as we actually hire and we, we live with some of this, we'll be able to do, to do that because we share your value. It is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the curriculum development work and, and professional development occurs in the summer. And uh, so... We're going to have to set a dollar number for this summer, 
and have to live with whatever that's going to be. And it might be certainly less than we've seen the last few summers, unfortunately. Do I have time for another? Go ahead. Okay. Um, in terms of curriculum, hard paper and books, and, and we were told we needed to update. Yeah. I, I, just as a sort of layperson, I, I value bodies over books, and I value old books to, to hiring a, a new body. I, I just, what, what placement, what uh, importance do you put on that um, priority in terms of can you get by with older materials so that you can get that extra math coach or that extra teacher? If I, if I may. Um, I'll let you go. Um, I think that at the middle school, we've been doing that. We've been doing it for 20 years, as you heard when they came to speak. I think it's time that we that we say we've gotten every dime out of this that we possibly could have. Um, I think also at the elementary school, we're asking teachers to teach Common Core in math, in literacy, in science, in social studies, without the appropriate materials. I mean, we're already asking way too much of them, but without the ap appropriate materials, that's, I mean, that's almost like, you know, breaking the horse's leg before it comes out of the starting blocks. I mean, it just, it just cannot, ha it can't happen. So we need to have those materials so the teachers at least have a framework to follow when they are able to do it, um, particularly in the, the, the compressed school day that we have. Mm -hmm. um, there's just no way that without those materials, well, they need a roadmap to, to see where they're going. Um, so we really looked and, and only funded those that we absolutely needed. Mm -hmm. And so those would be cur um, curriculum materials that are common core based at the elementary school. And at the middle school, we finally had to say, you know, if the countries have changed five times since we put out this textbook, <laughs> I really think that we, and, and yeah. I, I know I'm being sarcastic and I yeah. apologize, but, mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm, I'm just trying to emphasize that things have changed in the last 20 years and we, we just really, um, There's and, nothing with working with the companies to say it's like leases a subscription to Windows or Microsoft. Like everyone has to have a lease number, right? Like they can't borrow their cohort teachers. Well, actually, we only get um, one set of classroom books now, and we get digital copies for students to make use of at home. So we do not buy a textbook for, student, for each student anymore. We haven't done that in a really long time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The other issue... Um, is substituting curriculum materials or a, a person for the curriculum materials, we're gonna be funding the curriculum materials out of revolving account money. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not good budgeting to count on a uh, position to be funded from the get-go out of that. Yeah. Certainly what has happened in past years is we've sometimes gone to the reserve, um, and they're not really, it's not, we can call them reserve, but they're revolving accounts. Um, that in some cases are not entirely earmarked, that we've had to pick up a point two or something in those. But that from at this point in the process to budget out for, mm -hmm. it's not part of the base then. So I think for one-time expenses, this is an, a very appropriate okay. use of that money. Hmm. Thank you. Dr. Seuss? Uh, so I just have two questions in the statement. So. Uh, just a clarification about numbers. Um, the kindergarten new proposal by the governor, and we recognize that the governor's budget is only a starting point, mm -hmm. and that actually budgets originate from the legislature and may look very different eventually. Um, but how does that number for the kindergarten program compare to the amount that we were previously getting? I mean, it looks like we have about 500 students, about 175,000. That seem right. It's pretty comparable to pretty the comparable. kindergarten grant for this year. Right, and so, um, so we, you know, previously from that amount, we were only funding a half time TA, so we would be adding to our budget. You know, well, let's see what happened is that when we were deciding what would be put into the base budget, was mm -hmm. we, we, we could have said because the grant went away, and this is actually how we've handled grants in the past. Mm -hmm. When a grant has gone away then that, those positions go away. Right, right. But we felt that, very strongly felt that, we, you know, not to have uh, at least a half-time TA. So we didn't put it in the ad part. We right. could have done it that way. Mm -hmm. So now that we have done it this way, if the money comes out in the grant program the way we've done it, mm -hmm. it's for, it can't, it can't supplant but you've already budgeted. Okay, good. Okay. So, in some ways, by making that decision early on, we've we created a situation where it could feels like extra. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The other question I have about numbers is the 
um, the Chapter 70 increase. So the 120,000 is less than the 170,000 that Adam was accounting for in his budget. So do, do we then not get that amount? We, do, we only get anything above 170,000. Uh, it's 126, I believe, and I believe this is above that number, but we don't know that for a fact yet. Does that sound right? It's, uh, I thought we were, well, the increase sounded like it was below what Adam was expecting, so we wouldn't get any of it under the current proposal. Is that? No, uh, the, the agreement was regardless of what the Chapter 70 was, we would get the funding. So uh, through, through no. the no. entire, no. the no. agreement is, it had to be, if it was above. But if, but if the number came in above a certain number, yeah, we, we would get that. Right, yeah. but 120 is really below 170. That's what yeah. I'm wondering right. about. Yeah. Is the 120 already, is there somehow the 170 increase 120 on top of it? No. Or is it below it and so we don't get that money under the we governor's did. proposal? Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Can I read what he wrote in his budget? Go right ahead. Um, in addition to this significant increase, this budget recommendation further proposes that any increase in Chapter 78 above what is currently estimated, which is 126 thousand be provided to the school department okay mm -hmm. so we'd only get any and the uh, number because we just there was just sort of a comment about the 120 being something we could put into reserves and it sounds if like if we get it we don't have it's it. not in the budget mm -hmm. yeah so but it sounds like it sounds like even if we even if the, so suppose today the governor's budget has passed then according to the agreement that according to what adam's proposal is we don't get any extra money. No, Correct. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, Correct. What I, that's what I thought. So we mm -hmm. can't yeah. put anything in reserves because we don't get, mm -hmm. we don't have anything extra necessarily. We don't have the money yet. Mm -hmm. So it's no, not no, any part that, of the even budget. Even in the budget, <laughs> even in the budget, it's not. It's it. not in here. Okay, all right, so that was a question. Um, so, and then I just have a statement and I, I'm sorry to take up your time, but um, just to point out how constrained we are year after year, um, we, um, our per pupil spending is less than the state's average. Our per pupil spending is less than the, comp the towns to which we compare ourselves. And the towns to which we compare ourselves to is not Lexington and not Newton. I mean, we're way below that. <laughs> we're talking about much lower than places like Belmont and other places, um, I have the list over here, but um, we are um, number eight in terms of, you know, if you list the towns from one to 12, we're number eight. So we are constantly constrained. Um, this year is no different. Um, the town is also constrained. And I, I feel for the needle to which Adam has to thread, the thre or whatever, the threading the needle is a very, very difficult thing. Um, I think that we as a town need to have a conversation about what we want our town to look mm -hmm. like and mm -hmm. what we want our tax base to look like. Um, nobody likes taxes, but, but we need to figure out what kind of services, education otherwise, we want to provide to our citizens and what that's gonna look like in terms mm -hmm. of the, town ba the tax base. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that in the context of the enrollment discussions and the possible debt exclusion and the possible operating override, that that conversation happens and that we really go to the voters and ask them, what do you want? Thank you, Mr. Hainer. I'm deeply concerned about the, the cuts on the special education, especially at Audison and the high school. Uh, when the presentation was done uh, by the high school directors, they emphasized the, the, the need uh, for these positions for high needs in math, science, and English to maintain that level one school. That, that's the spot, the high need students, mm -hmm. where the, the, the one and two and the, the, even the lower ones, that's really where we get hit. Uh, the high school seems to get hit real hard in this whole budget. Uh, maybe their, their asks and their dreams were higher than everyone else. Uh, I'm an elementary teacher and uh, I value everything. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the special education and I would ask everybody, bottom line, if things, we vote a number, you folks take that number and you, you, there's possibilities you're gonna make changes and stuff throughout the year for the needs. I pride myself in saying I'm a member of a school committee that has a, a level one high school mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. all the programs at the high school make it a pristine high school. The building doesn't make it, it's quite obvious that we're, we're, we're producing phenomenal graduates in spite of the facility. Thank you. I, 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 my comments are 
just two very brief ones. I'm very concerned about the cuts to ELL positions. ELL parents are not the ones that come out here and squawk. Uh, those kids need advocates, and we should be their advocates. Um, uh, I also note that where we do not have level one schools, our, our shortfall is for high need students. And to be cutting funding for positions to address the needs of high need students, I have tremendous difficulty with. The other thing I would note as a town meeting member since 1992, 90, something like that, um, and somebody who's been involved in the town side as well as the school side, uh, since this last override, I've noticed absolutely no erosion of services or uh, angst about cuts in any other town area, but we're, we're being put through this. And I think there's something critically wrong with that picture. I think one of the things that we did um, when we went for this override is we said we would hold our property taxes and our spending to certain levels, but we'd also provide... Uh, maintain the, the, the level of services that we were providing uh, back when the override was voted. And with the increase in enrollment, uh, we're, we're not able to, to keep up with that. And we're not increasing the mileage of town uh, roads. We're not increasing the, the, the uh, number of homes on sewers appreciably. Uh, um, we're having a significant annual increase in students which are yielding higher class sizes and reductions of services, and, and I've got a problem with that. I mean, if we're one town and we have to absorb cuts as a town, uh, they shouldn't all be on our side of the street. And, and that's where I stand. Uh, so I guess it's time to take a vote, and I'll do that as a roll call. Mr. Heiner? No. Uh, Mr. Pierce? Yes. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Starks? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, Dr. Seuss? Yes. Ms. Uh, the chair votes no. It's a five to two vote. <clears throat> hmm? uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Can I ask one more question about the color code budget? Yeah, uh, oh. quickly. Uh, yeah. Um, what is the athletics money for? Um, if I may, the, um, the athletics department um, was somewhat tumultuous before Melissa Dugalecki took over, and we needed some time to figure out exactly what she needed to run it. This 125 basically funds what she has been spending. So it's not an increase to her budget, it's simply budgeting what she's been spending anyway. I've, you know, if you, when you see the budget book, you'll see that it's predominantly in the areas of transportation, which have shot up tremendously. The new transportation contract for okay. athletics is very expensive, and ice time. I mean, those are the two big things that we're getting hit on. Okay. Um, as you see, her whole ask was her having, based on a couple years of experience, what she needed to optimize the athletics budget and build and maintain the programs that she thinks the district really needs. And so that was the whole $246,000 ask. But the 125, I feel, is essential because the money's going out the door already. Okay. So we just need to be honest with ourselves about it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now for the good news, Dr. Bodie, MSBA board decision regarding Arlington High. Yes, it's, a, it's absolutely a wonderful decision. Um, yesterday, uh, I attended the board meeting and the a Massachusetts uh, School Building Authority Board voted into the eligibility period 26 communities. And Arlington High School was one of the communities. And there, we actually, a board member is a 1989 mm -hmm. graduate, so he mm -hmm. did make the still comment. Looks the huh? <laughs> still looks the same. He <laughs> still looks the same. He still looks the same. He was very, uh, very happy to see that uh, Arlington High School was on the list. So what is happening, and I think adds to a little bit of the confusion about this, is that uh, the commencement of the eligibility period is going to be staggered. And they've never had uh, such a big cohort coming in to, for, budget, uh, for uh, different projects. So this is a way to, um, I think, just sort of space, space out the, um, the, the process. Because I put into your, um, into Novus, you have a schedule 
that you can see what, has, what are the deliverables during the eligibility period, and there are very defined timelines for that. Um, for example, um, you have the initial compliance certification. You have 30 days to get that done. That one's not particularly a tough one. But going down the list, for example, the educational profile questionnaire, that actually is a very important document. In fact, it's probably one of the, the most important documents of this entire uh, list because they emphasized yesterday that your, pro your programmatic educational vision is what should dictate the building. Mm -hmm. And they take that very seriously and they really want to see what you're thinking about it. And, and what it's not even just the high school. We're going to have to be talking about the entire district. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing this with Thompson, and it took us a, a while to do it, it because you have to be very clear. Because then later you, you line up your, your uh, building in terms of what the design is uh, to that educational vision. So you have 90 days to complete that. And they, they can then, there's also a whole enrollment piece in this first. And that actually is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, another piece, a part of that enrollment which doesn't show up there is that there are actually uh, components of that. And, and people have asked me, well, when would we discuss whether the eighth grade would be part of a, a project later on? that's when you introduce the concept of a new, a new configuration. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot to all of what has to happen in this period of time. As you go through this process, if those members were on the, board, on the school committee at the time we went through Thompson, there are a number of board votes as you go through this. So we'll have a feasibility vote, and then you have mm -hmm. uh, other votes going forward. Um, in fact, when you saw the agenda yesterday, and I can actually give you a copy of it if you'd like, you can see all the different votes they did. You know, some people were going to feasibility, some people were getting mm -hmm. repairs. There was just a, a lot mm -hmm. of different, uh, different stages that people were in. But Arlington, I will make it very clear, Arlington has been invited into the eligibility. We are going forward with this project. Um, now, while we're not commencing right at the moment, that doesn't mean that there's not work that we can do, and it does not mean that we cannot um, go forward at Springtown meeting and uh, look at mm -hmm. al allocation of money for a feasibility study, which is part of this, this first module. I, I, want, I want to point out that if you drive around and look at all the cars and the license plates, once upon a time, every registration expired at the end of the year and you'd have to get a new plate on January 1st. And that became onerous for the uh, Registry of Motor Vehicles because they'd be swamped at the end of the uh, year. So now that uh, all the passenger plates are staggered over 10 months based on the last digit of the plate, so they can stagger all the re-registrations. And essentially, the uh, state's doing the same thing on these building projects. They have a limited staff, and they've got to stagger these out over the course of the year. So instead of having a, a, a one at, on our license plate, we'll probably have a five if we're voted in on May. So we're in the queue to get voted. Uh, it's just which uh, last digit of the license plate we end up with. So uh, the fact that Belmont got uh, a one on their license plate and we may get a five is not a big deal. Uh, we'll have the, the same uh, process and it'll give us uh, a couple of extra months to beat the deadline on on uh, doing the first uh, module, Mr. Hainer. Without opening a major can of worms, when you do the enrollment, do you have to include the 150 plus or 120 plus students that are at Minuteman in case tomorrow they decide to come back here? Well, that's a very good question, and that is something that will be part of all of that. Yes, okay. that's a very good question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thielman. The uh, 270-day period, that starts to run when? The day you commence. And what? So, for example, Belmont, Belmont, uh, among, there were eight projects yesterday that were voted to commence their eligibility period. And it actually starts two weeks after the vote. Mm -hmm. 
So they will commence and then they have to complete everything. Now, that's the outside of when you have to complete it. You can complete that module in the day after. Mm. Well, you could, mm -hmm. technically. <coughs> so, um, so I just want to clarify, they, the, they have not voted to commence for us. We have yet. not voted to yeah. commence but yet. we're commencing. <laughs> we will. We are well, commencing. Uh, I'm going to be, there are certainly things I'm going to be thinking about. Okay. All right. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's laid out here what you have to do. Right. So there's a lot of things that you can think about. You cannot give any deliverables mm -hmm. until two weeks after you be, commence. Okay. And could you just, um, when would you think, so the next, an action, are we going to take any actions at this, at this year's town meeting? Are we going to, sure. any authorization of? I certainly that? hope so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. We can start working on these things without getting in trouble with MSBA if it's before we've commenced. We're not going to be submitting anything. They're not going to review them with us. Um, whatever we do is just more or less our preparatory work. The but once you, you for each one of these, you can be working with your project manager. We will get assigned a coordinator and a manager. That you know, there's a, there's a back and forth. I saw that with Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thielman saw that with Thompson as well. But you don't even begin those discussions about any of this until you commence. Uh, okay, Dr. So we're, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So we're not actually, I mean, we'll do some sort of groundwork stuff, but we're not actually starting to work on the module things until after we commence. It's pre-commencement, really. We're not, really. We're <laughs> we, 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 we can do ready. our homework, but we can't submit it. No, but that's not what she's saying. She's it's saying she's not actually doing anything. Yeah. I mean, doing It's essentially, you can, you can, mm -hmm. this, I, I know what the educational um, questionnaire is going to be like, and it's certainly going to be thinking about it. Um, but once we commence, that has to be submitted within 90 days. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I, under I understand that. It's mm -hmm. just they also have rules about what you can't be doing before until you've entered the feasibility study or something. You, you can't decide on what your school looks like. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, or, yeah. or what you yeah, we're not right. doing yeah. that. No, 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 I know, no, no, I know. No, no. I'm just saying, I don't know where all those rules mm -hmm. are. No, and in fact, w when we went with Thompson, we had, um, we, we ca certainly came in with our preferred option, which was a new school. But we also had to come in with two other options. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what happens during the feasibility start, mm -hmm. the feasibility part of the plan. Mm -hmm. Because you're working at that point, because after this, and you have to, put your team together, which means you have to um, advertise for an owner's project manager, mm -hmm. and then of course a design designer, which is your architect. Mm -hmm. So you have got to get your team in place. You don't even begin the feasibility study until you have your team in place. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. I just... But, but you probably, mm -hmm. but a lot of people probably mm -hmm. don't yeah. understand what the process is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Oh, so I have more questions about the feasibility study. So we get the money potentially at town meeting in April. Mm -hmm. Um, we can't commence gathering the team and doing a feasibility study until we commence, until two weeks afterwards. Um, what would be sort of the time period that we could get our, the possible options sort of in front of MSBA, in front of people in the town? Um, what is sort of the range of time? Are we talking end of the summer? Are they talking, okay. <laughs> Are we talking mid-fall? Are we talking end of, of the winter, like just sort of a, a general to, range of, of what kind of time period we're looking at. Maybe you could help me. What, yeah. what do you mean options? Well, so, so I understand the feasibility study um, doesn't come up with three options that then is presented to MSBA and they weigh heavily on which one right. they're going to find. I mean, they choose which one they're going to find. Um, when, what timing, if we sort of worked our butts off, everything fell into place perfectly, what kind of timing would we be looking at to get those options before MSBA for them to vote on? Oh, to get the options, oh, that part can take a while. Okay. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, that, that was what took us the longest with Thompson. The Thompson project, roughly speaking, from beginning to having a dedication was about four years. Right, but what about the time where we like, okay, this is the option we're choosing, we haven't done any thematic drawings of it, but we're, this it's is. Gonna, that's gonna be 
that will take months to mm -hmm. do. And yes, there will be um, components where we, we reach out to, there'll be a lot of community uh, input yeah, into yeah. that. Mm -hmm. There will be a, a building committee that has formed under the um, very strict num mm -hmm. uh, roles that are, must be played in that. Mm -hmm. And then once you, you don't really go out until you get your designer and your owner's project manager. Okay, so just so, a general so winter, thing like, Winter but of next of, of 2016. I don't think we would be going spring of to actually delivering our three options until the sometime in the school year 17, 18. Okay. Easily. Okay. Okay. That's what it's I. It's a much later module. So, Mr. Thielman. Well, just so when the when the school building committee is selected, that committee meets and it's an open meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the options because they impact the town are discussed. They impact. The entire town budget uh, are discussed by the capital planning committee, mm -hmm. board of selectmen, the school committee, the finance committee. We made presentations with the Thompson right. to all those right. groups. They were all public meetings, mm -hmm. and there were meetings with parents. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of meetings that take place. Right. A lot of input, and there's a lot of back mm -hmm. and forth. And there's right. a, you know there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that you know gravitate to one mm -hmm. option or another and mm -hmm. push sure. to that option. And, sure. Mm -hmm. and so it's I just wanted to know and yeah. yeah. But I think I think seventeen eighteen is realistic, Mr. Okay. Pierce. There are eight modules, correct, in the process for the MSBA for us to go through eight. Yes. And yeah. we're just there looking. Are, in fact, you can go on the website, and there are I have that here. There are definitely eight different modules that right. you go through. Not each one takes the same amount of time no. or the same level of work, correct? Mm -hmm. So, assuming that you can do some of the preparatory work in-house before the commencement period begins does that shorten the project outcome for us at all if, if possibly but another one could be unexpectedly take more time uh -huh. for example Thompson it took us more time because remember that debate that was going on in, in different uh, groups in town about whether we could use the field mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have the th that whole process took a long time uh -huh. So you might save some time on one, but you might end up having more. And this is going to be a very complex project, mm -hmm. very. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the one thing that there was a meeting after, well, sort of after the board meeting, well, sort of towards simultaneous to the end of it, people, the towns that were invited into the eligibility period. And, you know, they really caution us not to really talk about how long it would take or mm -hmm. uh, at this mm -hmm. stage. Right. Um, but we, you certainly can use your experience with an elementary school, which was for, you know, at that time, 380 students, mm -hmm. brand new, and how long it took us. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at what it would take for a high school. So, you know, you're looking at, it's certainly not going to be a four-year process. Five years might be a very, you know, very accelerated mm -hmm. process. Go ahead. Dovetail on that. I mean, since this is the year that they've accepted the most 26 uh, districts or whatever, um, is there any thought or concern about them overextending as a, as a state agency in terms of will the funds mm -hmm. be there when our license plate five comes up? Or, or, or three or what? They're doing it in March, May, and July. Um, no, they're very careful about this. And that is one thing. They don't, they sort of, well, they don't know the exact number, clearly, uh, as you because you go through this process. But at the same time, uh, they are very careful about not overextending, mm -hmm. and they've figured this in. And and then as you go through the different modules, you're going to get down to the module um, where you're going to have your um, uh, your project scope and budget. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, they they know where you are in the budget, and that mm -hmm. money is encumbered. Okay. Their contribution is in comfort. Now, one of the things that does get confusing for people as they go through this is that, you know, even though you get your base rate, and we'll probably get that sometime in, in the, this first part, that could actually change because when you actually go to the building and you start going through all the different parts, some of it may not be eligible for reimbursement. Mm -hmm. For example, in this building, I am, well, I don't want to say it emphatically, but I think it would be very likely that we would not get any reimbursement for any town offices, mm -hmm. for example. Um, 
if you were if you were another high school that wanted to put a turf field in the back, mm -hmm. there's no reimbursement on that. Mm -hmm. um, a swimming pool. Because it's mean, not deemed what educational. It's not in the. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's not that it's not educational. There's certain certain things that they will not reimburse you on. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if you decide to go ahead with that, even though it's not reimbursable, um, then. It, the percentage that they're mm -hmm. paying out of the project can change. Right. I, I just don't want there to be any sort of, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, squeeze in terms of s districts that have come before us, and then by the time they get to us, they'll be so. less willing to partner in the kind of school that we want mm -hmm. for Arlington. Mm -hmm. You know, if we say we want it for this amount of students, they'll say, well, we can't give it to you for this amount of students. We can't give you a percent uh, partnership for that amount, we have to limit you to. They, I don't no. want that. No, for they, us. I, that, I, they're very well managed that way. Yeah. I, w I wouldn't be concerned about that. Okay, they're pretty consistent in terms of the way they deal with people. And one of the reasons that why, why we're there is that uh, back in the old program, uh, if you just think of Newton North when they just loaded up everything you could possibly want in a wish list and got a sixty-some odd percent reimbursement uh, as a, as a matter of right by the way it was done. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they set a series of standards of the things that right. they will pay for. They will bill, They will pay for this amount of square footage for this number of students and this th these kind of things, mm -hmm. but not those amenities. Mm -hmm. So that if we wanted amenities into the building, that would be outside the reimbursement. We have to do it 100% town funding. And you have to be careful with that too, which is the experience that Concord had mm -hmm. recently. And I don't won't go into it tonight, but th there's a fine line between paying for an amenity and whether it, it goes beyond what the partnership agreement is mm -hmm. anyway. So okay. is right. early childhood, is that something they reimburse? Um, I did hear from another superintendent yesterday that yes, they, they okay. did reimburse in their school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, indeed, this is good news. We now go to superintendent report. And we had a special town meeting on Monday, didn't we? We certainly did. That and it was, was very special mm -hmm. and very, very, very and that beneficial. Was actually top of my list. Yeah, I, I saw it on the list here. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it's easy when I've got cue cards. <laughs> it actually, I, I was, I couldn't have been more pleased that the, the town meeting. I want to, I want to exp express my gratitude on behalf of all of our schools to town meeting members and to the community for supporting Stratton and Thompson the, the way they did that evening. It really was, um, I think it showed a great show of support. And I do know from talking with um, one of our representatives that that's actually something that actually MSBA does take note of too, because mm -hmm. that is a show of support for the buildings in the school district. So that was absolutely terrific. Mm -hmm. And so we're moving forward with um, the Stratton project and um, moving forward with uh, funding two modulars at Thompson Elementary next mm -hmm. year, which is terrific as well. So, and, and I, I also, be, before I, we end the conversation on the high school, I do wanna also say thank you to everybody who participated, and Diane in particular, in working on the, um, the statement of interest. I think that we did a, I think we did a very good job, and certainly the second time we did it, we did even a better job. But the, the, the school spoke for itself when they came for a senior study. It's clear mm -hmm. we need that. But there still mm -hmm. was a lot of collaboration on doing a good job on the SLI, and so I want to acknowledge that and thank everybody. All right. Um, okay, so we'll come back to the professional learning network because um, I'll mm -hmm. have Dr. Cheston talk about that. But you had mentioned uh, the Martin Luther King um, event, and we did get a declaration. This, this year, the Martin Luther King Birthday Celebration Committee wanted to acknowledge and commemorate the 50 years METCO has been in our, our district. And um, it's sometimes, you know, it's like when you take a, you get a birthday and you hear the new number and you go, how did, we, how did that happen? <laughs> you know? Especially the big ones. And uh, 50 was a, quite, a, quite a significant number. And Arlington stands out mm -hmm. in that the, as, soon as, as soon as the program opened up, Arlington was right there. Seven communities, it's grown since then. Um, so we are, we are one of the originals. 
And so in honoring uh, this event, this milestone, um, the Martin Luther King Committee honored three people who have been very important to that, one of which is doc, uh, Dr. Jean McGuire, who is an icon. She, was, she has been the executive director, I believe, since 1973. And she has been an amazing force uh, for MEDCO, um, expanding MEDCO, helping get MEDCO funding for our districts. And she was honored that night and, and attended. Uh, we also acknowledged uh, Steve Pereira, who has been, who worked in Arlington for 32 years as the Metco director, mm -hmm. and he was there that night as well. Uh, and Steve, is, as you know, remained very active in many ways, both in Arlington and in the district, as well as outside. And one of his activities in the district was being AAA mm -hmm. president for a number of years. And then we also honored our current director of Metco, which is. Margaret Credle Thomas, and it was terrific to have them, all three of them there that night. We also, which I thought was a particular treat, was having some of our graduates come back. And uh, recent and even graduates that um, graduated some years ago. And, and before the event, I had a chance to talk to one of the women who is now a kindergarten teacher and has been for quite a while in Boston. and. And she just, I tried to talk her into coming here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she's very happy she's and uh, but has very fond memories of her years here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the event went really well. And Pearl Morrison, again this year, outdid herself. She just, she does so well as the, um, the moderator. Um, there was a quote, I, there was some of the literature that was there that night, but there's a quote that, um, that someone found from Martin Luther King, which I read that, I read that night, and then I've read it since then, and it's just, I, I thought I want to, I would like to share it with everybody, because I think it is, um, in, the, in the world that we're in today, it really resonates. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So he's a man who speaks truths over many years. So it was a great event, and I think Arlington should be very proud of the fact that they do this every year. And, and there were, had to be 250 people there, easily. Mm -hmm. It was a great event. Did you want to talk about the Learning Network? Because um, that was, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we've talked about this a little bit uh, with the committee, but we are part of a professional learning network. We were selected to participate that um, in that. Um, that's uh, taking a look at teacher leadership and um, uh, a lab site model similar to what we have. Um, uh, the group of uh, folks, including Ms. Hansen, uh, myself, um, Tammy McBride, another one of our literacy specialists, Matt Coleman, who is our math director, um, Carolyn Shediak, who's one of our math coaches, and Thad Dingman, who's the principal of Dallin, uh, visited um, Wakefield and uh, heard from their uh, staff about what they're doing in terms of coaching and lab site models, and we presented to them. So we will have a long-term relationship with them throughout this year where we will visit each other's uh, districts, and Arlington actually will be hosting a meeting at EDCO because, as you know, we have slight issues with parking during the day in Arlington, so we'll be at EDCO, but we'll be hosting um, the March meeting um, of the PLN, which involves eight districts, yeah, eight districts across Massachusetts that are fo focusing on teacher leadership. So it was a great opportunity for us. Um, they have a beautiful new middle school that we got to see. Mm -hmm. um, so it was uh, kind of interesting for us to see what a, a new school looks like at another, uh, another district. Um, but also for us to hear what they're challenged with and what we're challenged with and to get ideas from one another. And we'll be continuing to do that throughout the, the year. Um, a couple more things. Um, ACMI uh, would like to do, is planning on doing, a series of segments honoring Black History Month, which you know is in February. And uh, uh, one of the, the program editors, in fact, um, who, who uh, Ms. Starks worked with, uh, Sarah Fowler-Franco, sure. is actually 
uh, the person behind this, ev this event. And what they, want to, what they want to interview people about is what does Black History Month mean to you? And that is the only question they're going to ask in the interview. And um, our town manager, Adam Chapelain, has set aside space and time in the Lions hearing room, which is on the second floor, and inviting all of you, if you can fit in time to come for a short interview about this. Um, I'll send you these in an email, but I also want to say publicly because th the public is invited to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, the times are this coming Monday, February 1st from 10 to 1. Granted, that will limit people who are working. But then on February 3rd, that's just Wednesday, it's from 1 to 3 p.m. And then on Thursday, February 11th, from 3 to 7 p.m. And I will send that out to all parents as well and staff. Uh, our students, I'm hoping that we will take, have some students go over and uh, participate in this as well. So it's just one question. What does Black History Month mean to you? Um, let's, I want to just talk a little bit about the February 24th. Uh, we're going to have a forum for pa elementary parents on the Common Core and the Park Assessment <coughs> on February 24th. It's been scheduled at uh, Thompson Elementary, and I'm going to let Dr. Chesson give a couple more details about it. So it will be um, from 7 to 9. Uh, it is for elementary parents. We will um, also be having a meeting um, sponsored by OPEC, and we're waiting to get the date for that um, for grades 6, 7, and 8 parents. So this will be a meeting for elementary parents, um, particularly in um, all are welcome, but it's particularly for uh, parents who have students in grades 3, 4, and 5. Um, there will be also a separate meeting for Bishop parents because, as we've discussed, Bishop is going to be doing the test using computer-based testing. And so we'll be having, I'll be attending the Bishop PTO along with um, Ms. Hansen, Ms. McBride, and Mr. Coleman to talk about um, the, the testing environment that will be specific to Bishop. Um, but uh, all are welcome to either or both presentations. And we'll be talking about the schedule um, and how we'll be preparing students, but um, you know, really how we're just test driving it and really want students to feel comfortable but not pressured. And that's exactly how we want our staff to feel as well. Okay. Okay. The 24th is at Thompson, not at the... At the Thompson. 24th yeah. is the at Thompson, Thompson. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. Yep, and we'll send that reminder out to you and to all parents as well. Multiple reminders, mm -hmm. as we talked about. The last thing is kindergarten registration. That is going to be occurring in March. Parents are going to be getting letters. We'll, we're, we're, in fact, all the letters are going to, I think, leave here on the 9th of February uh, because of... Um, the registration will begin in early March. We've a little, a little bit later than, about a week later than we were last year because we've uh, invested in some new software and uh, been working to make sure that that is up and running and we'll be launching it. But all of that will be happening very soon. I know we're, we already are getting calls and have been actually for the last few weeks about when kindergarten registration is. And so we're gonna put all those dates on the website. Mm -hmm. um, they've just been uh, finalized. Okay, we now go to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes from September 24th, 2015, December 10th, 2015, and January 14th, 2016. Approval of warrants, number 16100, dated January 7, 2016, in the amount of $655,561.25. And approval of warrant 16104, dated January 14, 2016, total warrant amount $218,775.25. Moved by uh, Dr. Seuss, second by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Oh, hey, wait, we have. I said, pull it. Need to pull January 14th, please. Pulling January 14th. Anything else that needs to be pulled? Okay, uh, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Was I here on the 10th? 
Or is that the one I missed? You hmm. um, missed one in December. You were there. He, he I was missed, there. You missed the next one. I, think. I missed the next okay. one. Okay. <laughs> you were then the other don't night. pull that one. Okay. So we have <laughs> just the 14th then. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Now we will move the uh, minutes of January 14th. Uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Aye. Okay, one abstention, six in favor. That gets us through there. Now we go to the uh, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. We start with policies and procedures. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll be meeting on uh, Monday, February 1st at uh, uh, 8 a.m. Uh, or is it 5, yeah, 5 p.m.? 5 p.m. Yeah. here. Uh, we're going to go over <laughs> school committee meeting dates and times for the uh, coming year, as well as a couple other uh, issues. Okay. Um, facilities, Ms. Starks. Uh, budget first. Oh, budget first. I'm sorry. I'm okay. Changes you pages. heard most of what we talked about with budget. We had a meeting yesterday. Um, in addition, we talked about how the budget will be presented and, and work towards getting you the color-coded list that you saw today. Um, and we'll be meeting again in the future, but we haven't set the date yet. Okay, now we go to uh, facilities, Ms. Starks. Excellent. Uh, facilities met last Thursday um, to start the discussion on the uh, middle school enrollment issues. Um, and uh, to that end, you have in Novus a document called Handling the Enrollment Challenges at Audison, mm -hmm. um, which is a only partially filled in table. Um, but I thought before we spent much more time filling in the table, it would be best to have all of your eyes on it. So our goal is to have this document filled in to the best of our ability with at least estimates of timing and costs, et cetera, um, for the school enrollment, task force, school enrollment task force meeting that's happening on February 23rd, which is the week after February break. Um, Facilities is meeting on the 9th of February uh, before that to try to make sure that we can actually fill it all in. So um, mm -hmm. at the Thursday meeting, we kind of created this table um, and the information that's in that document and then uh, asked the superintendent to go off and try to fill in as much of it as she could. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to come back on the 9th, what time? review that, um, look at it, and then hopefully have it ready for the 23rd. But I was hoping that um, while you guys had a chance to look at it, you could give me some feedback mm -hmm. on what you think and uh, what kinds of changes or other items should be on there. Sure. Uh, Dr. Allison Hampe. Can I make one suggestion to add, which is including, I don't know what you call the model, but where teachers don't have a homeroom, there's a staff room that they share and then mm -hmm. the classrooms are able to be utilized more. I know that won't fix everything forever, and I know it's not necessarily a popular option with mm -hmm. teachers, but it might help during the first crunch time All right. for a little while. Yep. Okay. Any other comments or remarks regarding this report? Uh, Mr. Thielman. You know, I just, there was a comment by a uh, parent, uh, by Timor, Got your last name, Yontarp. Yeah, uh, tonight. I, I and I and I were you know the sub mm -hmm. the subcommittee meets on the 9th, February 9th. Mm -hmm. And so, what you had to say tonight about speeding things along or, or working as quickly as possible, that's going to be taken up at the mm -hmm. meeting on the 9th at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, here. And I would point out that subcommittee meetings are far less formal, and uh, uh, we invite the public to carry on a conversation with us at that point. <laughs> and, and you know, one of, just to and Dr. Bodie, you know, one of the things we will need for the meeting on the ninth is information and some of the things we've been talking about. So, so any cost information, operating cost information, and operating cost comparison between using mm -hmm. a, a new school, creating a additional space at the Addis, and using the Gibbs. So all that stuff. The more information we have on the ninth, the faster we can mm -hmm. move the process along. Right. Uh, District Accountability Curriculum Instruction Assessment, Mr. Thielman. Okay, so um, we we are ta our, our subcommittee was is tasked with 
Um, coming up with the evidence Dr. Bodhi has to present to the mm -hmm. school committee uh, for her evaluation. The policy requires that by March 31st of the fiscal, of the, of the March 31st of 2016, or March 31st every year, Dr. Bodhi has to give an interim report on, um, for her evaluation on the goal, on, on where she is at, or the district is at, and she is at on, on the goals that have been selected, the standard goals, and as well as the goals that have been selected. So um, if you open up your uh, document, you'll see what the committee has come up with, the subcommittee has come up with for first read is uh, the, f uh, the following uh, pieces of evidence. So evidence for each standard. Standard one, uh, instructional leadership is a vision statement or another document describing instructional leadership in the Arlington Public Schools. Uh, two, the teacher leadership curriculum within, within the APS professional development plan and then three, park scores correlated with prior MCAS results showing academic performance outcomes of Arlington students K through 12, including subgroups. One of the reasons why we pick three measures is because, correct me if I'm wrong, in a teacher evaluation, generally you give three measures per standard, is that? Mm -hmm. Three pieces, three pieces, of, three pieces evidence. of evidence. Three mm -hmm. yeah. pieces of evidence, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three pieces of evidence, my apologies. Management and operations, budget presentation of the school committee, finance committee, and town meeting, reports, materials, minutes of the school enrollment task force, SC members' observations of the superintendent in public meetings and evidence of her attendance at public meetings. And standard three, family and community engagement is the newsletter, the newsletters that the uh, superintendent sends out each month. List of events of the past year designed to engage the public in school issues. So uh, Dr. Bodie's assistant, administrative assistant will put together a calendar of uh, the park meeting and other meetings that take place. Results of a survey of parents and community members of APS Issues if conducted by uh, the Community Relations Subcommittee. And then standard four, we came up with one for professional culture, which was an annual staff survey results, the survey to be drafted by the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment and Accountability Subcommittee in April and distributed to staff in May. And then evidence for two practice goals. One four is the park reports, which is the same information as above. And then the other evidence goal that Dr. Bodhi chose, develop a plan to address space needs and the evidence required um, is uh, the McKibben report, a plan to respond to the report and communication received or sent to the MSBA regarding the AS, AHS rebuild. So that's what we came up with. This is a first read. Can you tell me where that is? You said it was in Novus. It's in Novus. It's in Novus. It's in Novus. Novus. This document awesome. here. Under the bottom. Community relations. It's, uh, it's in the reports it's down there. It's down here. Uh, reference Last material. One. Okay, got uh, it. Superintendent yep. evaluation. No, thanks. You know. Okay, great. So, um, go ahead. Mr. Hainer. Just a quick logistic thing. The, what Mr. Thielman mentioned at the beginning on the 31st, that's the fifth Thursday of the month. So the, I just suggest for Dr. Bodie's, uh, the 24th of March would be us, the only meeting prior to that we'd be having this year. The policy request by th the 31st, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The meeting is on the, we have five Thursdays that yeah. month. I assume right. we're not but gonna But it doesn't have times. to show up on a meeting. Second or fourth, right. yeah. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, community relations, Dr. Seuss. Uh, yeah, do you want me to present the survey? So just to close notes? the loop on this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> if anyone has any suggestions mm -hmm. or changes, um, you know, we need to hear about it. Maybe you can send uh, Karen uh, your thoughts and that can go to the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. And if we collect a lot of stuff, then we'll meet again. If not, we'll presume this is okay and we'll have a second reading in a mm -hmm. week, in okay. two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Dr. Seuss. Yeah, you want me to present the survey as well as the other oh. stuff? If the, okay. it's within your domain, go okay. for it. Uh, so, well, we had a meeting tonight, and I'll go backwards. Um, we took up three things, uh, the last of which was a discussion about sending a survey to parents and educators and, and staff um, about calendar issues. Mm -hmm. uh, every year we worry about various calendar decisions. Should we start before Labor Day, after Labor Day? Um, various other questions. And it's a very complicated issue, but it would be great to get a sense of everyone's opinion. Perhaps when we do this survey, there's no consensus. Mm -hmm. It's like 25, 25, 25. Mm -hmm. But perhaps there is, and it'd be great to know. So that's our goal. So um, Ms. Hans and I are meeting uh, next week to try to craft something to go out at the same time to both teachers and, um, and parents. 
to ask these basic questions. Um, the thing we took up middle is uh, just a discussion about what we're going to do um, for the Common Core slash Park presentation. Uh, some discussion about how to solicit questions from parents before, during, and potentially after the presentation. Um, and then some discussion we had once talked about potentially merging that discussion with a big picture discussion about testing and Common Core, and we decided that was too complicated to do in that one meeting, and we'd have to pull those things apart. Um, the first thing that we took up was the issue of uh, uh, district lines or buffer zones. Um, this was something that we talked about referring to the Community Relations Committee last time we met. And the sense of the Community Relations Committee is that it is a valuable thing to do to talk about especially expanding buffer zones with the caveat that we would be operating under the assumption that we would do something similar to last time. Existing kids would be grandfathered and siblings would be able to stay in the same school as their siblings. Uh, the idea was that this would not do any drastic solutions, but it might help us in certain cases when, for example, we might be able to get away with seven grades at a, in an area rather than eight um, if we expand the buffer zones. Uh, we, if we do this, and there was, it was unclear when we were going to start the process, but, but, but if we do indeed start the process, um, we thought that it would it should take at least a year, you know, or, or, or something around that time to get community input to really sort of flesh things out. So actually, what, what I wanted to get from the committee tonight, this is the, the subcommittee sort of sense, but, but is, is from the rest of the committee, what are your feelings about that kind of process, beginning that kind of process and, and with those assumptions? Yeah, Bill. I'm sorry. Hain sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> April, you get this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hayner. <laughs> I, I, I think it's very important. You said it. It's, it's very limited. It's going to take some time. I think, again, I just want to emphasize to the community that uh, this is not going to be an immediate solution to the enrollment yeah. issue. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, my one comment is I got an email from a Precinct 9 resident who wrote to me as a town meeting member saying, what are you doing trying to move me over to the Stratton School of the Bishop? <laughs> I said, wait a minute, no, no, no. The, the, we're, we're not going and making radical <laughs> changes. We're going to do this, take a look at things, and uh, if we expand the buffer zones, it, uh, if, if you're in the bishop, you're going to stay in the bishop. Um, but it, it's just a first level of conversation, which we're really charged with talking about. Whether we come up with uh, any kind of changes that make sense or solve a problem is another story. And we're not going to start making changes if they don't solve a problem. Um, anything else, Dr. Seuss? Uh, yes. So um, I felt I should finally report out uh, the survey results that we've been <laughs> batting around mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, it was never time critical, so we kept pushing it on the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but a, over a year ago, we did a survey of parents, primarily around communication. Um, we received um, 1,366 results, about 35% of parents, mm. families, with, families within mm. our district. Um, I actually think that's a pretty good number. It's not, you know, when you do surveys, it's not bad. Um, there, uh, there's a two-page uh, survey summary on Novus if, if anybody um, wants to look at it. But I'll just talk about the highlights. Um, parents thought we were... Parents are very proud of their schools. They feel their children are proud of their schools, that, they're, that they have excellent schools. Um, they feel that we have great teachers and that the parents and the community is engaged and that kids are, are happy and self-reliant. Um, they're generally happy with communication. Uh, so those are the really good hi highlights. Um, uh, areas of challenge, things that we have to work on. Uh, and I have to stress, these are not things that we're unique in, in, in respect in a district. Mm -hmm. um, homework, um, mm -hmm. many parents, some parents felt that the homework was too much, uh, especially at the middle school level. Um, anxiety, uh, this we know is a national problem uh, that we've seen uh, rates of anxiety increase and social and emotional issues sort of become more center stage. And Arlington is not alone in that. Um, some parents wanted more challenging curriculum. Um, 
more ability to be involved, um, and some, some issues about discipline. But the question that I actually want, wanted to answer when I suggested two years ago to, to do this survey is um, my fantasy question. So I wanted to report on that. Um, I wanted to know if, some, if we were given a windfall amount, what would your priorities be as parents? And parents had the opportunity to choose three priorities. So, so the, these are my top three choices. Most parents, unsurprisingly, chose that they would like to add more classroom teachers so as to alleviate overcrowding, or you know, to make classrooms smaller. 27% uh, of parents chose this as one of their top three choices. Second and third most popular among elementary school parents were split between adding foreign language at the elementary school and making the school day longer. And we had a limited number of options, so there, you know, parents might have other, other priorities, but those were, those were the ones we wanted uh, of our options. Middle school parents wanted math coaches, increases in technology, and a longer school day. High school parents wanted math coaches, increases in technology, um, and this was interesting. Um, fourth choice among high school parents only was eliminating sports and music um, suites. So this was important to 11% of the parents we surveyed. They chose as one of their top three options, mm -hmm. but it was the fourth most common. Mm -hmm. So it was something interesting to know because I know many parents are passionate about uh, that sports and music fees are too high. We all certainly feel they're too high, but just to know what, where does this fall in our priorities? Because as um, Dr. Elson Ampey mentioned, budget to some extent is a zero sum game, and when you add to one, you have to take from something else. Um, so that's it. I mean, uh, some open response. Uh, people talked about the utterly dispiriting facilities of the high school. Well, thankfully, we are on the road to changing that. <laughs> um, you know, class sizes, stuff about crowded facilities, um, the, stuff like that. So, so the survey results are on Novus, available to the public, and the summary is as well. Thank you. Executive Session Minute Review Subcommittee, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the, I have spoken to town council. He's willing to go through it. I'm working with uh, Ms. Fitzgerald to make a copy. I'll secure it and hand carry it and uh, share with him, and hopefully he can fit us in and we'll be, uh, I'll have a report with those that we can release, those that we uh, can't release, sometime probably in April. Thank you, Warren Committee, we all got paid? Or we didn't get paid. You didn't get paid, paid. no. <laughs> yeah, you get your, you get <laughs> your usual nothing. zero check. I got paid. Yeah. I got my nothing. Not, not on my signature. Either. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. They committee. all get paid. Yeah, we're all going to get a 10% raise next year. Okay. Right. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> Thank thanks you. to the governor. Um, school enrollment task force. Uh, I think you've heard. I think we've heard yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our public agenda. We're about to do executive sessions, so the motion will be to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining and litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be con uh, conducted. Uh, among the list of things would be AEA Unit C Administrative Assistant Contract Update and negotiations for non-union personnel. To do this executive session, motion by Mr. Thielman, yes. second by Mr. Pierce. Roll call, Mr. Hainer. Aye. Mr. Pierce. Aye. Uh, Aye. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Uh, yes. Ms. Starks, Mr. Thielman's yes. Dr. Seuss. Yes. The chair votes in the affirmative. It is seven to nothing. We are in executive session. We're not returning. We're not returning. Uh, we will yeah. not be. We will not be uh, in, in, in advice. It will not be returning. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Yantar. I uh, hope we see you again.